Right, good evening, everybody. Um, I wish to thank Michael uh, Merrigan for inviting me to give this presentation today. Uh, next Tuesday is the 83rd anniversary of the sinking of the Asalda. And um, I think it's nice and fitting that it's so this presentation is so close to the anniversary. So I'm going to be talking about Patrick Short. Um, 1896, 1940, uh, my uncle, and I'll introduce you to, to the family now. The man, the background is Patrick Short Sr., my grandfather, and the little boy in the middle is Patrick Short, who ended up on the Isalda. The other, the others in the photograph is his mother, Emily uh, Dillon, um, and then his sisters, um, Anna Mary, Emily Constance, and Florence is on her, uh, Emily's lap. Uh, he also had another sister that died in, it was born 1897, died 1899. And then he had a, a little brother who was uh, born and died in 1907. I reckon this photograph was taken about uh, 1903, uh, late 1903, early 1904. Uh, Patrick's wife, uh, Emily, there died in 1909, and he married in 1910, Catherine Coe. She died 1914, and then he married my grandmother, Esther Coe, her sister. And my mother then was born when Patrick Sr. came back from the First World War. I've set out here a timeline of the service of Patrick in both the Royal Navy, the uh, Royal Fleet Auxiliary, and then in 1927 when he joined Irish Lights, right up to the 19th of December 1940 when he was killed on the Asalda. Patrick uh, served in, in the Battle of Jutland and he served on the HMS Chester. Patrick was a stoker. And he joined the Navy in 1916 and was demobbed in 1919. This is his um, naval record. And the, the piece to the right is the details about the Chester. The Chester was actually laid down for the Greek Navy, but never was never handed over to the Greek Navy. It joined the, the Grand Fleet. Sorry, this is Pat, this is an update of Patrick's uh, up close of Patrick's um, naval record, and we can see there there's a mistake on the naval record with regard to his date of birth. He only served on the one ship. Pembroke was a training place, and he only served on the Chester. The Chester was involved in the Battle of Jutland, and it was hit by seventeen shells. 29 of the crew were killed, 49 were wounded. And one of the crew, a 16-year-old, uh, John Cornwell, was rewarded the Victoria Cross. This is one of the guns on the bottom left is what um, John Cornwell uh, was uh, manning. If we look at it here, this is the Grand Fleet coming out from uh, Edinburgh and Leith. And here's the, the rest of the Grand Fleet under Jellicoe coming down to meet the German fleet, which is in the red line there, which is trying to escape out to the North Sea. Here is the formation. Sorry, this one isn't in colour. This is the German battle fleet, and this is the Grand Fleet of the UK. And the Chester is part of that squadron there. This is a 700 page document that was published after the, you know, about 1923, giving a blow by blow account of the Battle of Jutland, which was the 30th of May to the 1st of June, 1916. I have highlighted the Chester here uh, with the blue arrow. It's in the middle of the German high fleet. Here's the British fleet up here in black, and here's the German fleet here. It was very, very lucky to escape. 
It had oh, its guns knocked out. Luckily, it had damage to the to the superstructure, but it wasn't holed below the waterline, and it managed to it to to, uh, to make it back to hull. We can see here that the damage above the waterline and the damage on the decks here. This is what Patrick would have been. He was a stoker, so this was his role here. I said already that Patrick was um, demobbed in, in, in early 1919 in March, and here he is joining the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, and he's on the Presto, which is a, a tanker that's following the fleet. The name, there's no names of the ships, just the ship's numbers are on his um, merchant card here. There's the pretzel and pretzel and history of it there. So it, it, it last came out of service in 1958. So now we're going to move on to the um, to Patrick's service within the um, the Commissioner of Irish Lights. So first of all, I'm just going to say something about the Isolde. Many people don't know that the Isolde was built in the Dublin Dockyard and was um, was launched in, on the 28th of January, 1928. And it was um, named by Mrs. Andrew Jemison, wife of the chairman of the commissioners. Uh, the assault was 198 foot long. It had a beam at 32 foot 4 inches and it had a depth of 15 feet 9 inches. And she was 400 and, and 734 gross tons. This is Patrick's service record uh, in Irish Lights. So his date of birth there is correct. He joined the service in, on the 1st of December, 1927. And he was, he was fireman on the Alexandra, and then he became fireman on the Isolde in September, 28. Sorry. When I retired, I said I was going to look at the Isolde and do a research project on it. I was looking to see who were the who were the crew on the Isolde. I knew there were six injured, or and that was changed later to seven. I wanted to find out which crew were going to the barrels, which crew were going to the conning bag. I wanted to get a a, a wreck report. And Patrick then had uh, four sons. So I did a bit of research on them, and I knew that the letter books of the Commissioner of Irish Lights were in the um, the national uh, the national archives. When I started to research, I realised that this was a huge project. The guards took statements from eighteen of the twenty three survivors from the Isolda crew. Six out of the seven light ship men. Also, military intelligence uh, G2 branch conducted their own inquiries and they interviewed all of the lookout posts from Holt Head to Forlorn Point for all movements on the 19th of December 1940. The G2 branch sent that file on to the Department of External Affairs, and that's to be found in the military archives in um, Rat Mines in Battlebro Barracks. Also, the, the um, lookout posts kept logs, and, mo and a lot of these are available online on the military archives website. My other source then was the letter books. These are the letter books from the Secretary of the Irish Lights, and they are in the National Archives. And I had a look at 
at them. And I then saw that there was communication with the RNLI, the lifeboat. And I did some research there. The other element of the research that I'll be looking at today is the censorship. And I'll also look at to see how the widows and the the children were um, taken care of. These are the two uh, lightships, the barrels and the, the conning bag. They were taking seven uh, relief crew out for the Christmas to these two lightships. That was their uh, sailing orders. The assault was nearing the conning bag lightship when it was attacked and bombed by a, a German aircraft. Um, we can see there that there is the word lighthouse service is written on the side of the vessel in large um, five foot letters. And the letter books in the National Archives go into how and when this uh, task was taken in early 1940. These are uh, Kenneth King's paintings uh, they de depicting the attack on the um, Isolde. Here are the six men that were killed on the Isolde. And I'm hoping to visit Kilmore Quay at 11 o'clock next Tuesday to lay some flowers at the Memorial Gardens uh, on, on opposite to the lookout post on Forlorn Point. So it's Patrick Dunn, the coxswain, Patrick Farrell, the seaman, James Joseph Hayden, the fireman, William Holland was the steward, William Rushby was the leading fireman, and Patrick Short was the fireman. This is a letter that was written by uh, Thomas Scott White, one of the officers to his, to his, um, to his wife. He was injured and was in the county hospital in Wexford. And in it, he says, um, I saw poor Short lying naked uh, and dead on the, on the deck. And then he goes on to say that Rushby, Hayden and Holland and Dunn are gone when the lifeboat uh, was blown to pieces. So that's a, a first-hand account of the how the six of uh, the Asalda crew met their end. There is a, a narrative going that the relief men were placed on the barrels and then the ship was heading for the conning bag when it was attacked. But having examined the guard, the six guard statements made by the light ship men, I asked the question, why were the lightship men who left their homes that morning in Wexford, the 19th of December, 1940, who got the half seven train to Rosslair and were bound for the barrels, still on board the Asalda when she was attacked and bombed near the Conning Bay? And the lightship men were a Thomas Hoare, John Gold, who was actually injured, John Joseph Flynn. Uh, John James Murphy, William Gowden, and Ambrose Smith, and rather, rather, uh, Robert Arnop uh, was the mate on, on the barrels. Um, we have a lot to thank um, Ambrose for, because he named in his guard statement um, all of his travelling companions that morning from Wexford out to the uh, pierhead to pick up the um, to meet up with the Asalda. These were the agencies involved, and I have today I have focused on the Garda, the the Ogley Naharan, the, the, the Army, Irish, the Commission of Irish Lights, the lifeboat. I have a little bit on the um the German response. The Free State Government, the, uh, the Department of External Affairs, as it was called then, and the British Government. I'm not covering the British Government today, and I'll explain why. With the British Government, we have Trinity House, the British Ministry for Pensions, the British Ministry, Ministry for Shipping, 
the Admiralty, the London uh, Assurance and the Caledonian Assurance Company, and the Fishermen and Marine Mar Mariners Royal Benevolent Society. That's a whole work in its own right that I haven't got to yet. The Gardaí took statements from about 18 of the 23 survivors on the Isolde, that's the Isolde crew. But this is the statement from Captain Bestick. And having a ship blown from underneath him, it was nothing new to Captain Bestick. This was, he also had that experience in the First World War. He was third officer on the RMS Lusitania. And on the, 15, on the 7th of May, 1915, off the old head of Kinsale, it was attacked by a U-boat and 1,197 were killed and 767 survived. The Garda headquarters in Wexford under uh, in, in, but the investigation was conducted by Inspector Carr, who was standing in for his superintendent, who was ill. He sent a report to Garda headquarters in Dublin, who in turn sent the file over to military intelligence in Parkgate Street. At the back, uh, attached to the statement of Thomas uh, Scott White and Alexander Guy, which is the statement on your, on your right, they attach drawings to their statement and Inspector Carr has actually witnessed the um, the drawings and their, and their statements which they're attached to. Military intelligence set up their own file and their own investigation and this is the front cover of the military intelligence file. The military intelligence, as I said already, visited the LOPs from Hothead to Forlorn Point, LOP 15. And they interviewed and took statements from the volunteers or the NCOs that were on duty on the 19th of December. The drawing here is from the sergeant in charge of the machine gun nest on top of a cliff in. Um, overlooking Rosslair Harbour. There was 83 lookout stations uh, around the coast and they are there marked with the red dot. Forlorn Point would be this one here. This would be the hook head here. And then you'd have um, uh, Rosslair Harbour where they, where they sailed from is, is just above there. The leading uh, authority on this period of Irish history is Michael Kennedy's book, Guarding Neutral Ireland, and the Maritime History of County Wexford by John Power has a piece on the Estalda, and it's the volume two version. This is Forlorn Point. It's had a revamp recently, and it's had new windows and that installed. And this is the the technical drawings for the smaller version of the look of, of a lookout post. I have some pictures coming up of what the lookout post looked like. This is Forlorn Point, and this is Forlorn Point before the makeover. And the the era and the the number which it corresponds to the um, lookout post. These came later on in the war, but they weren't in place in, in 1940, in December 1940, when the assault was attacked. These are versions of the single story um, lookout posts that were constructed around the coast. As I said already, the lookout posts also kept a, a logbook, and the logbook. Uh, are, can be found on the online on the Irish military archives. This is the one from Forlorn Point uh, on the on the on the nineteenth December.
this is the, the, the version from the German um, thing. They, they, they took the Asalda as being a school ship. In other words, they, they, they assumed that, she, that they, well, they used the excuse that she was a, a, a mine layer. And um, that was the reason why she was sunk. The Asalda was also flying the, uh, the Blue Ensign as well, even though it had the big letters on the side, uh, Lighthouse Service. I went down to the lifeboat station in Kilmore Quay and I found there a logbook for 1940. Uh, gives the crew that uh, went out to look for the wreckage. It gives you the sea state and it's a um, very, very comprehensive um, account of what task they undertook on, 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 on the day. Now, this is the last entry in Lloyd's registry. And I'll just give you what Irish Lights put into their letter books and uh, inform the Ministry of Shipping in England that the, this, the capital loss of the ship was 44,284 4, £44, pounds, 13 shillings and one penny. And they wrote off two boys of 270 pounds, a total write-off of 44,554 pounds, 13 shillings and a penny. There's a very interesting um, account in, in the letter book. The letter books are sort of a one-sided conversation. And it's, so it's the outgoing letters, but sometimes you're lucky to find some inward correspondence as well. But James Wickham of Rosslair, he was also head of the lifeboat in Rosslair, uh, salvaged number two long boy off the Isolde. And he was looking for £500 uh, compensation for the, for the salvage. And the Irish Light uh, started beat him down to £250. So little things like that you can see in the um, in the in the letter books. Censorship um, in the letter book. I found a, a what would you call a press release from Irish Life, and they sent it across with a letter to the censor's office in Dublin Castle, and that never saw the light of day. Um, as soon as the hostilities ended, um, all the papers, the Irish, Irish press, the Irish Times and the Independent have virtually the same um, text as if the correspondent was in, um, in Kilmore Key um, interviewing and giving an account of um, what was happening. But these are all dated papers from 1945. If you'll have a look at the papers that were issued around the time, you go and you look at the London Derry Sentinel, the Birmingham Daily Post, the Weekly Irish Times, and the Dublin Evening Mail. They don't go into great details, they just say that a, uh, they, they're more interested in the 18 pounds that was paid to the lifeboat crew. And um, it doesn't say in great detail, it doesn't go into any detail about the, the sinking of the Isolde. Um, so you can't, we can't rely on newspaper um, uh, accounts of at, at the time because of of the censorship. 
this is Patrick's on the left. This pa uh, is Patrick's uh, memorial card, and the other then is is, is the acknowledgement by the uh, the, the merchant seamen's of the loss of Patrick and the and the Isolga. Um, I also then looked at the letter books in relation to the correspondence with the with the widows and how much compensation, how much they were getting. So Kathleen Short and her four boys, the widow got one third of the compensation. Each week the men out of their wages had to pay in to a, a, a an insurance fund, but they couldn't take an action against the Irish lights or else they didn't get the money from the insurance fund. So, um, and the children got two thirds of the compensation. In Kathleen Short's case, the compensation paid was four, 44 pounds, 13 shillings and four pennies. And the children, the four boys between them, got eighty-nine pounds, six shillings and eight pence. The widows had to have a trustee for the children's element of the compensation. And Kathleen Short first had the Reverend John C. Kelly, and he was replaced by the Reverend Morris Brown C.C. He's buried in um, Ballymore Eustace. This is a, a, a something from the National Maritime Museum in Dunleary. But um, I just bring in here the welfare of the crew when they arrived, the survivors arrived in um, Kilmore Key. Mrs. Godfrey took the uh, ship's officers into her house, and Tom Sutton in the Wooden House Hotel took the crew in and looked after them. And there's letters of thanks going to both of them from the um, from the Secretary of Irish Lights. Others who got a mention were in, in the records was uh, Thomas Hanrahan, the master of the Laharone. He sent a message regarding the the location of the, the ship when it went up the assault when it was attacked. And he sent that to Sergeant McGrath at the Pierhead Guard Station. And um, William Godwin, in his statement to the guards, mentions that a Harry Matthews, a car owner, was in Kilmore Key, and he gave the light ship men, and um, he took them back to Wexford. Military intelligence also interviewed a George White, a WHYTE, from Arklow about the movement of aircraft in the um, in the area. There's a number of memorials to um, to Patrick and his lost comrades on the Isalda. The one in question here is the the one in City Key in, in Dublin. There's also a one in Tower Hill in London. Uh, at the entrance into the foyer of the Irish Lights uh, headquarters in John Leary, they have a model of the um, Isolda and the names of the crew that were killed. Also on the Memoir Memorial in Bray down near the Dark Station, this year on the, on the, on the back of it, they have put the, the, those who were killed in the Second World War. And Patrick's name is now on the War Memorial in Bray. As I said earlier, I hope to be in Kilmore Key next uh, Tuesday morning at 11 o'clock to lay some flowers in the Memorial Garden. And as you can see the red arrow there, the light ship, uh, the, sorry, the, the, the Isolda is mentioned on the memorial there and the six crew members who were killed.
This is the memorial at Tower Hill in London to merchant men who were killed in the in, in the in the Second World War. But before I finish, I'm going to read a file a, a, a file summary note that's on the file in the Department of External Affairs, which is now in the National Archives. And the, the, the summary on the front of the file reads as follows. It's a short paragraph. The Commissioner of Irish Lights, Tender, Isolde, was sunk and bombed on the 19th of the 12th, 1940, off Wexford. It's a matter of conjecture whether the vessel was attacked inside Irish territorial waters. Six of the crew were killed and seven injured. Members of the crew reported seeing Vostika on the attacking plane, but no protest was made to the German government and no claim for compensation was made. The Isolde was a British-owned registered in Dublin. And that's the view of the Irish Lights, or sorry, uh, of the Department of External Affairs. Um, Eamon de Valera was both Taoiseach and um, um, Minister for External Affairs at the time. I'm very thankful to the General Register's Office, Irish Census Records, the RNI both in, in, in Wexford and in Cool, Military Archives, National Archives, Newspapers, Ancestry, Find My Past, Root, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, the UCD digital website, which I use to identify all the guards who took statements. So I have identified all the Gardaí, I've identified all the military men who were present both in the lookouts and who conducted the investigation. I have identified the full crew of the um, Solda and the seven uh, lightship men who were going out on relief, the Commissioner of Irish Lights and the National Maritime Museum. In Dunleary. Uh, if there's any questions, thank you very much for your attendance. And I'll now hand you back to uh, Shane.